Wonderful being with you this morning. Thanks so much for the invitation to uh, worship and to share in this sermon time. Um, as our bulletin says, it is the third Sunday in the season of Easter. So as you know, Easter is a season. It is not a day. And because of that, it's probably appropriate for us to continue to share that threefold call and response that historically is always done on Easter Day, but it's encouraged to continue because Easter is a season, not a day. That three, uh, twofold response is Christ is risen. The people say he is risen indeed. We say it three times because historically, the thought is that this is a way to honor God, the reality of God in the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, or Creator, Christ, and Comforter. It also, though, is a way for us to affirm our faith in the resurrected Lord as Peter three times denied Jesus, we now have a chance three times to affirm that in fact Jesus remains with us. So if you'll share with me in this call and response, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Amen. I would imagine from time to time, you have shared with yourself or maybe suggested to someone else, let's go for a walk. And you might have uh, done that simply just to maybe get out of the house for a while, or maybe you just needed to kind of walk and think a little bit. Now, I don't know about you, but I experienced that some walks are longer than others, and it is not so much because of how far we travel, necessarily, or the terrain that we travel, but rather maybe the burdens that we're carrying while we are walking, okay? The walk seems a bit more challenging, necessary, but with carrying those burdens, we walk with them as well. Today in our scripture passage, we see that there are two walkers on the road to Emmaus, and they themselves are burdened, are they not? What they are burdened with is the reality that their Savior, their Lord, has been put to death. He has been crucified. So they are using their walking time as also talking time. And maybe you've done the same thing with someone else. As you walked, you talked. And that's what the followers on the road to Emmaus are doing as well. They are trying to make sense of the nonsensical reality that in fact the one who they thought was the Son of God actually was crucified and put to death. Now remember, part, these two followers are not part of the original 12 because at the end of the story it says that they go back to Jerusalem and they report to the 11 what has happened. So basically these are followers and we know historically, yes, the original 12 were called by Jesus, but there were other followers and supporters of Jesus as well, both men and women. So that's probably who these two people are. And one of them is named Cleopas, the other is not named. Interesting, Cleopas is only heard about in this particular story, and we never read about him again throughout the whole New Testament. Kind of fascinating, he's such an important figure, but we never hear about him again. So why did the two walkers leave Jerusalem heading to Emmaus? Why did they do that? Well, it seems to me that maybe they were as fearful as the other disciples who were behind locked, closed doors, that in fact they were afraid for their own well-being also. And so they needed to kind of get out of Jerusalem so that they might be able to feel safe and secure. That, I think, is probably one of the major reasons that they leave. And again, as they are leaving, they are trying to make sense of everything that had happened to Jesus and to them as well. Now, in this walk with Jesus, Jesus shows up, but they don't recognize Jesus. Interesting, why is that? I sometimes kind of wonder whether maybe the grief was so overwhelming for them that they thought Jesus is dead, dead and gone, if you will. So why would they think that they would see him again when they thought because of his death, they would never see him again? Maybe that's part of the reason they just didn't recognize him from the very beginning. They don't recognize him because they are overcome with grief. Now, I don't know about you, 
But from time to time, I have been asked, sometimes kind of in artwork or doing some mosaic work, create or share the image that is in your mind about a certain thing. It's trying to kind of get the, the mind out of just thinking and talking, but to try to create images. So it's a bit more kind of colorful about what you're thinking and how you're thinking. And I must admit, if somebody was to ask me, create an image in your mind that represents the resurrection of Jesus Christ, I pretty much think that to begin with, my image would be that of a brilliant flash of light. I don't know what your image would be, but if I image the resurrection, that's what I start with. The resurrection is imaged for me as a brilliant flash of light, representing the resurrection of Jesus. And it represents that brilliancy because it tells us that God, in Jesus' resurrection, has not only overcome death, which is a brilliant thing in and of itself, but it also means that the resurrection has overcome the death-dealing powers that people have to face in the world. And the death-dealing power that Jesus had to face in his life and times was the Roman government. So Luke tells us then that after Jesus gets into this conversation about the reality and the importance of what had happened, he begins to kind of gently probe them and asking them questions. And that's the uniqueness between my image and Luke's image. My image is a brilliant flash of light. Luke's image of the resurrection is Jesus walking and talking on the road to Emmaus, okay? How common and ordinary is that, but how extremely important it is for our life and faith. And in the midst of that walking and talking, he asked the question, what are you guys talking about? Okay, very natural, normal kind of thing to say, is it not? What are you guys talking about? And so they have this conversation, and they begin to kind of tell Jesus all the things that have happened in their life. And actually, Cleopas responds to that question as if he's saying, are you the only stranger in all of Jerusalem that doesn't know what has happened? It's kind of like he's saying to Jesus, what planet are you living on, okay? The crucifixion was in all the papers in Jerusalem. Don't you know about these things? And then Jesus begins, I think, to serve kind of as a therapist. And so he pushes the conversation a little bit more. And he says, what things are you talking about? I don't know about you, but Jesus at that point, I think, kind of becomes a therapist, if you will. Okay? I don't know if you've ever been in any individual counseling or group counseling. From time to time, I've been a part of groups that are, have a counselor or kind of a coach there. And if they want us to say more, they basically say, well, tell me more about that. Okay? Just as a way to kind of keep you talking and kind of enhancing and fulfilling what it is that you want and need to say. So in their sharing then of what are you talking about, tell me more, what they share is their hope, their forlonged hope that they thought Jesus was going to be the one who would come in and redeem and renew all of Israel, okay? That's what their hope was. So when Jesus says, tell me more, they share their forlonged hope that in fact, who they thought Jesus was going to be and what they thought Jesus was going to do was going to bring the fulfillment and the fruition of everything that God got started in Israel. I don't know about you from time to time, I kind of feel connected with that forelonged hope. Have you not ever had a moment in your life where you've kind of said, wow, I just was so hopeful that things were going to turn out differently. Ever had that moment in your life? just was so hopeful that things would really be different or really be better. And so when they are told that, I had such hopes in Jesus, that he would be the redeemer of Israel, what Jesus does is then he begins to review scripture. He gives them kind of an orientation and an outline of what he was up to. And remember, he starts with Moses and the prophets. They got everything started that God wanted to have happen in Israel. But then I came and I completed all the work that God wanted me to do. 
So Jesus is trying to tell them, okay, I know you are hopeless in some respects, but let me just remind you about what the story is about me, okay? Moses and prophets got everything started. I came then and I was able to fulfill everything that happened that God wanted as in Israel, but now in me. So in that conversation, Jesus still remains a stranger to them, okay? He is still a stranger. They do not recognize who they are. And so they are so taken, though, with what he has shared with them that they begin to ask him, okay, it's getting dark. Won't you stay with us for dinner? And Jesus does. Now, in the Gospel of Luke, it's important for us to remember that Jesus is eating all the time. It's the one primary activity that Jesus does in the Gospel of Luke. He constantly invites himself to meals on the behalf of others, or others invite him to come and have a meal as well. So Jesus was, I wouldn't say a partier, kind of, but he sure enjoyed a meal. And when it was offered to him, he took advantage of it. The interesting thing, though, to remind ourselves is that eating for Jesus was a radical activity of how you break down barriers with other people. So in the midst of all the activity of all the meals, Jesus was basically saying, when people did get together in fellowship and in food, even though they are different, what happens is the walls begin to kind of come down. And so Jesus was constantly eating because he was trying to remove the walls of the rich and the poor, the righteous and the so-called unrighteous between men and women, between Jews and Samaritans. That's what Jesus was trying to do as a radical act of removing walls. So when Jesus decides to have a meal with these two followers, okay, not disciples, but followers, basically he is saying that I'm not here to kind of share with you, to respond to your cowardice and maybe your, even your own stupidity. I am here to try to remove the barrier of your disbelief. That's why Jesus is having a meal with them. Does that make sense? So there's a, a wall of disbelief between the two followers and Jesus. If Jesus says, I'll have a meal with them, he's just following the radical activity that he did throughout his entire life of using a meal and the fellowship to lower the barrier that people had with one another. And for Jesus, having this meal with these two followers was his way of trying to lower the barrier of disbelief that existed between them. In the end, all the disciples were saddened about their hopes in Jesus. My reading of it is, even though in the end, many of them saw the empty tomb, but Peter went back and they still didn't believe that Jesus was resurrected, even though Peter said the tomb is empty. They did not necessarily originally believe in the women, okay? Women's testimony was often discredited. Why? They were women, okay? But what happens is that at that moment, Jesus is understood to maybe be one that they shouldn't have believed in in the first place. There is a moment in the life of the disciples where they're kind of feeling like maybe it was a mistake, okay? Maybe who we thought Jesus was and could be with these days going by now, where's the future? Where's the hope? Where's Jesus? There is no Jesus. Maybe this was all wrong to begin with. Don't we sometimes say to ourselves, time for a reality check, okay? Time for me to just say, am I really dealing with the real world? Am I really dealing with things as they are rather than as I want them to be? Does that make sense, okay? So I think that that's what the disciples are dealing with. Time for a reality check. We thought substantial change was going to happen in us and the world. We're seeing nothing. Maybe again, this was all wrong. But then Jesus catches up with the followers and he catches up with us as well. And sometimes in our walk with the Lord, we begin to kind of hear something or respond to something 
or we read something or someone says something that maybe our hope is just lifted a bit more, that there's a sense that yes, there is meaning to life, that in fact, Christ always walks with us even though sometimes we are not sure about that. And the wonderful thing about the Emmaus story is that it takes a while. You know, they're walking seven miles from Jerusalem to Emmaus. That's a bit of a long walk. It takes the whole day. And I think it just reminds us that sometimes Jesus' walk with us takes time. And we have to be patient. Does it not? Okay. So it's one of the important things that when Jesus walks with us and talks with us as the hymn goes, what happens is that we begin to decide that we're not going to give up on life that life was more meaningful than we ever thought, that somehow something has been shared with us that our hope is resurrected, our faith is resurrected, our life is resurrected, and we know that walking in life means we never walk alone. Somehow, some way, Jesus is always by our side, sharing things with us that sometimes we hear, sometimes we don't, but we will never, ever walk alone. That's the fundamental faith of what this story is about. Jesus has come back to remind them that they will not walk alone. Over the years, some folks have said that the Emmaus story is really a journey or a story about the journey of every Christian because it has so many characteristics and ingredients of what the Christian faith is about. Things like disappointment and disbelief and doubt, but it also has elements of risk and then it also has things in it like profound wonder, profound hope, and a fundamental belief that yes, God is on our side and is always working on our behalf. The resurrection story is a story about movement. Jesus is walking on the road, the followers are walking on the road, and so this is a movement in which Jesus is once again trying to say, let's try this again, okay? Let's make sure that we do not give up on each other, but in fact we remind ourselves that I'm walking with you because now you are to be the living witness of the reality of the resurrection in your life. That's why Jesus came back to the disciples, to remind them that they are the reality of the resurrection in the way that we might share hope with others, or love with others, or confidence with others, or belief that we are always walking and never walking alone. Interesting, Jesus does say in this conversation with two followers, wow, you guys were foolish and really slow to believe. But the thing I like about Jesus coming back in this resurrection story is that there's no kind of heavenly handedness going on. There's no kind of godlike power play that he's involved in. It seems to me that rather he's encouraging them to once again listen to what he's trying to say. There's no way that there's any anger in this conversation. Did you sense or see any anger in what he was saying? There's no sense of revenge that he has, okay? Yes, he has called them foolish and slow of heart, but he did not say that in fact they were stupid and I'm going to remind you about how stupid and how cowardice you were, no. He has this conversation in which he reminds them that in fact, I'm counting on you to mirror the life of me in the life that you still have. And that's what it means for us to be a resurrected people. We too have decided we are going to try to mirror the life of Christ in the life of you and me. The resurrection tells us God is not done with Jesus. The resurrection also tells us God is not done with you. Okay? That's what the resurrection is about. God had more plans for Jesus after his death. God has more plans for you and I in the life that we still have remaining in our life. Above all, the resurrection means that we will not allow us <clears throat> to ever think that God is not with us. It may take time. It may take patience. We may have to have a confidence that we feel sometimes is undermined, but nonetheless, the resurrection says God will not allow you to walk alone. He is in it with you and for you and will be with you always. So my suggestion is that the next time you take a walk, 
you might want to kind of remember this Emmaus story. And to also remind you that Luke in the book of Acts says that the best way to describe the Christian faith is that these are people on the way. That was the very first way that Christians were described. They are people on the way. On the way of following the life of Christ and trying to do that as best they can. And even in the midst when sometimes we might be a little foolish and a little slow of heart, Christ is there to remind us, you do not walk alone. I am with you. Amen.